first, let me give you an overview of what we're going to cover in this video. We're going to talk about ortho, para, and meta directors, uh, which groups are activating, deactivating, uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution, and the difference of that with nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. We're going to talk about how to rank compounds in, in terms of their reactivity. We're going to go over a list of reactions that you need to know for your tests. We're going to go over some synthesis problems and mechanism problems. And then towards the end, we're going to focus on nucleophilic aromatic substitution. That's going to be like the last 5-10% of this video. But the other 80-90% will be focused on electrophilic aromatic substitution. So let's begin. On the left side, we have the ortho para directors. And on the right side, we have the meta directors. Just so you know, ortho is 1, 2, and para is 1, 4. Meta is 1, 3. I'll explain how that will apply soon, uh, shortly. Now, notice that all of the activating groups, except the weakly activated ones, they have lone pairs on the first atom, aka the, the amine group has a lone pair, the OCH3 group has a lone pair, even the amide group has a lone pair. When you see that, it's strongly activated, and it's usually an ortho pair director. However, if you look at the halogens, they have lone pairs too. Now, they're weakly deactivating, but because of the presence of the lone pairs and how they can donate electron density by resonance, the entire left side is, uh, is ortho pair directors. The only exception is the R groups. Even though they don't have lone pairs, they are weakly activating because they donate electron density to the ring um, by means of the inductive effect rather than resonance. Now, if we look at the groups on the right, these are the meta directors. And notice that in the first atom that's attached to the ring, the benzene ring is like right here. There's no lone pairs on the first atom connected to the ring. In fact, all of those atoms are partially positive. This carbon atom is partially positive because it's attached to oxygen, which is partially negative. The oxygen atom is pulling electron density away from the carbon, and that creates a partial positive charge on the carbon. Same thing here, too. Now, these groups are strongly deactivating. If you look at the sulfur, it's being pulled by three oxygen atoms, so it has a, a very powerful partial positive charge. Same thing with the nitro. This carbon um, is being pulled by the nitrogen. The nitrogen pulls the electrons toward itself, leaving a partial positive charge on the carbon atom. Now, if you look at the uh, groups on the left, the ortho para directors, this nitrogen has a partial negative charge. Same thing is true with this nitrogen and that oxygen. So the benzene ring is attached to an atom that has a partial negative charge. And so those um, benzene rings tend to be activated because they can donate electron density to the, uh, to the benzene ring. Now, even though fluorine is, well, fluorine also has a partial negative charge, so it's also an ortho para director. Now, notice the difference between NH2, which has a partial negative charge, and NH3. Even though in both cases nitrogen is electronegative, here we have a positive formal charge, and it converts from a strongly activating group to a deactivating group. Even the nitro group, the nitrogen has a positive charge one of the oxygen atoms has a negative charge. But you can see a pattern here. All of the meta directors, the first element has a partial positive charge or a positive formal charge. And for the ortho para directors, the first element usually has a partial negative charge. Between carbon and hydrogen, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So carbon has a partial negative charge. Hydrogen is partially positive with respect to carbon. So do you see that trend? All of the first atoms for the ortho para directors have a partial negative charge, and on the right, for meta directors, they have a partial positive charge. Now the next thing we're going to go over is uh, we're going to make a distinction between electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions and nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So EAS, that's going to stand for electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. 
in this reaction, a hydrogen will be replaced with an electrophile. So therefore, it's called electrophilic substitution. We replace a hydrogen atom with an electrophile. And it's aromatic because we're dealing with aromatic rings like benzene. NAS stands for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. For these types of reactions, we're going to replace like a, a bromine atom with a nucleophile. In this case, the nucleophile could be like hydroxide. We're going to talk about this towards the end of the video. So that would be an example of a nucleophilic aromatic substitution reaction. For EAS, this is the electrophile, therefore the benzene ring is the nucleophile. And nucleophiles tend to be electron rich. So the more electrons you add to a nucleophile, the more nucleophilic it would be. So think of the electron donating groups that we talked about in the last slide, such as like the, the OH group or the NH2 group. If we put an OH group here, it can donate electron density to the ring, making it even more nucleophilic. And that's why um, whenever you have a lone pair here, it can make the ring more nucleophilic, and therefore it's usually activated, with the exception of the halogens. If you add like an NO2 group, um, those are electron withdrawn groups, the meta directors, and so they deactivate the ring because they make the ring less nucleophilic. For nucleophilic aromatic substitution, it's the other way around. The alcohol, the OH group, would be a deactivator because in a nucleophilic aromatic substitution, the benzene ring acts as the electrophile instead of the nucleophile. So an OH or an NH2 group, they would deactivate the ring because they make it more nucleophilic and less electrophilic. However, um, groups such as NO2 and uh, like carbono groups, SO3H, the meta directors, they would make the ring more reactive towards nucleophilic aromatic substitution because they make it more electrophilic. They pull electron density away from the ring. So I just want to go over that. So let's say if you get a question, and let's say it asks you to rank the following compounds in order of increasing reactivity towards EAS, electrophilic aromatic substitution. So let me give you a list of compounds. Feel free to pause the video and try these questions yourself as well. So towards EAS, we're going to say that um, group number one is the most reactive and number four is the least reactive. So for electrophilic aromatic substitution, the benzene ring is the nucleophile. So the activating groups, the orthopara directors, they make the ring more nucleophilic. So phenol will be an example. That would be number one. Number four is the nitro group. It's a powerful, strongly deactivated meta director. Number three is the aldehyde. It's a moderately deactivated meta director. Number two is the fluorine group because it's weakly deactivated and it's an orthopara director. But this is number one, the most reactive. Now, if we were to rank the reactivity of these compounds towards nucleophilic aromatic substitution, it's going to be the other way around. In nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions, the benzene ring is the electrophile. So electron withdrawing groups such as NO2 will make the ring more reactive. So this would be number one, this will be number two, and that's number three. Phenol would be the worst for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Okay, now let's talk about why um, phenol activates the ring towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. So there's phenol. It has two lone pairs. Now, and let's say here's an electrophile. So this is an EAS reaction, and therefore the benzene ring is a nucleophile. Phenol, well, the alcohol is an electron donating group. 
and it activates the ring because it makes the ring more nucleophilic. If we draw the resonance structure, it can donate a pair of electrons, and that would make this ring have a negative charge. As we can see, it has a carbanion instead of a carbocation. So the ring is more nucleophilic because of the negative charge. It's more electron rich. Now let's look at uh, NO2. Let's see why it deactivates the ring towards an EAS reaction. This oxygen has three lone pairs and that one has two. That oxygen has a negative charge and nitrogen has a positive formal charge. So here's the electrophile which has a, a positive charge. And we're still considering we're still analyzing an EAS reaction. So the nitro group can withdraw electron density from the ring. So we call it an electron withdrawn group. It can pull this double bond toward itself. And this is the uh, resonance structure that we're about to draw. And so now the ring has a positive charge. And this positively charged ring does not want to react with the electrophile because like charges, they repel each other. And that's why NO2 deactivates the ring. It puts a positive charge on the ring, and it doesn't want to react with an electrophile. It wants to react with a nucleophile. A nucleophile would definitely react with that carbocation. So that's why uh, electron withdrawn groups work better for nucleophilic aromatic substitution. They don't work very well for EAS, and that's why they're deactivating groups or they, they deactivate the ring towards EAS reactions. But the phenol, like we considered before, it created a, carbo, a carbanion, which had a negative charge, which is attracted to an electrophile, which has a positive charge. Opposite charges attract, and that's why um, phenol is an activator towards EAS. Okay, so now that we covered that topic, Let's talk about the reactions that you need to know for this test. So I'm going to go over a list of reactions. And for now, just feel free to write these down and just make sure you know them. And then I'll show you how to apply it soon. So the first reaction we're going to talk about is nitration. Now, you can look up the mechanism, but I'm just going to give you the end result of the product. In this reaction, a hydrogen atom is going to be replaced with an NO2 group, and that's nitration. The next reaction is bromination, Br2 and FeBr3. FeBr3 is the catalyst that makes this reaction work. It helps generate a, a, a bromine electrophile basically a bromine with a positive charge. It replaces that hydrogen with one bromine atom. But here's a question for you. Let's say if you add bromine to nitrobenzene. This is called bromobenzene, by the way. And whenever you see an NO2 group, it's a nitro group. What's going to happen if you add bromine to nitrobenzene? Now, whenever you have a substituent on a ring, it's going to tell the other group where to go. Now, remember we talked about ortho, para, and meta directors. NO2 is a meta director, and it's a deactivator. So this ring is less reactive than the original ring. However, it can still work. Now, we said that meta directors are 1, 3 directors. So let's say if this is carbon 1, the NO2 will direct the bromine to go towards carbon 3. We can also count it this way. This is also the meta position. Now, these two positions are equal. So if I put a bromine atom on both, or on either, um, we're going to get the same product. So I'm just going to put it on one of them. So that's what meta directors do. They direct any new electrophile to the meta position. So that's the product of that reaction.
Now, let's say if we perform nitration on uh, bromobenzene. Where's the NO2 group going to go? Now, bromine, it's, it's a weakly deactivating group, but it's still an ortho pair group. Ortho is in the second position relative to the uh, bromine atom. It's 1, 2 is ortho, 1, 4 is para. So the NO2 group can be directed in this position or on carbon 4. So we can get a mixture of products. So the first product I'm going to draw is the ortho product, which looks like this. So if we want to name that compound, it's um, ortho bromo nitro benzene. And let's see if I can fit the other product. I'm running out of space here. So this product is called para nitro, um, para bromo nitro benzene. We have to alphabetize it. B comes before N. So here you get a mixture of products, and that's why you need to know all of that information on the last page. Because you need to know which groups are ortho pair directing and which ones are meta directing. But I just want to give you a preview of how to apply um, those directing effects. But let's go over some more reactions that you need to know. The next reaction that you want to add uh, to your list that you need to memorize is chlorination. If we add chlorine with the aluminum chloride Lewis acid catalyst, we're going to replace the hydrogen atom with a chlorine atom. The next reaction that you need to add to your list is iodination. So if we add I2 with nitric acid, it simply replaces a hydrogen atom with an electrophile, which is iodine. The next reaction you need to know is sulfonation. If we add SO3 with H2SO4, or just H2SO4 with heat, um, you're going to get the same product, which is basically SO3H. Now keep in mind, if you have two molecules of H2SO4, um, actually even just one molecule of H2SO4, if you add a lot of heat to the reaction, H2SO4 can decompose into water and sulfur trioxide. So pure sulfuric acid could generate the sulfur trioxide electrophile, and that reaction could work. So you need heat to make it work. However, this reaction is reversible. For example, if you add H3O+, this will convert back to the benzene form. So that process is desulfonation. The next reaction we're going to consider is the Frito Crafts alkylation reaction. And we're going to spend a little time talking about this one. So let's say if we add a uh, methyl chloride with a Lewis acid catalyst. Basically, the Lewis acid catalyst takes away the chlorine atom, and then you're going to get the CH3 with a plus charge, and the benzene ring is going to attack that electrophile. So the electrophile in this reaction is this. It's a methyl cation. And this is going to be your product. Now, you can add potassium permanganate in the presence of an acid catalyst, and this is going to convert it well, maybe that's not a catalyst, because it's what is going to be consumed in the reaction. But this will be converted to a carboxylic acid. So that's how you can make benzoic acid from benzene. You can add methyl chloride, then oxidize it with potassium permanganate. Now, instead of adding meth ethyl chloride, excuse me, methyl chloride, you can add ethyl chloride with an aluminum catalyst. 
and then you'll get CH2, CH3 instead. And then following that, let me start on a new page. So once you add your ethyl group, you can add NBS. NBS is a radical reaction, and it doesn't react with the benzene ring, it reacts with the benzylic hydrogen outside of the benzene ring. And this is useful because you can create a lot of different products with this process. What's going to happen is it's going to replace a hydrogen atom with a bromine atom. Then after that reaction, you can add sodium hydroxide or any other strong base. And what's going to happen is you're going to have an E2 elimination reaction. Hydroxide is going to grab this hydrogen. This is going to form a bond. Well, those electrons will be used to form that double bond. And the Br will be kicked out. And so you're going to get styrene. Basically, it's like a, a double bond outside the benzene ring. At least I believe that's styrene. Sometimes my memory of compounds uh, fails me, but I think that's what it is. But you can get that product too. And from styrene, you can make so many other products. You can do any type of alkene addition reaction. You can add HBr, you can add H3O+, turn it into an alcohol, BH3, THF, hydroboration, oxymercuration, um, all sorts of reactions you can perform with an alkene. But you're going to have to follow these steps to get to styrene first. Now, let's say, let's go back to Friedel Crafts calculation. What's going to happen if we add, instead of methyl chloride or ethyl chloride, what if we add propyl chloride with an, alum an aluminum acid catalyst? Here's what we will not get. We won't get this product. Instead, we're going to get uh, this one. Here's why. The aluminum acid catalyst, it takes away chlorine atom. And when chlorine leaves, it creates a positive um, carbocation, but it's primary. And primary carbocations are not stable, especially if it's adjacent to a secondary carbon. What's going to happen is you're going to have a hydride shift. And so your plus charge is on a secondary uh, carbon. And so the benzene ring, it attacks there. So that's why um, it's attached to the secondary carbon. Well, right now it's tertiary, but before it was it um, before it's connected to the benzene ring, it was secondary. Now, the methyl cation that we formed before that that can't rearrange, and the ethyl cation won't rearrange either because both carbons are primary. So you don't have that issue with methyl and ethyl chloride with the Friedel Crafts alkylation. But when you start having like propyl chloride or butyl chloride, you need to watch out for rearrangements. The benzene ring is going to attach to the more substituted carbon atom of that structure. So now let's talk about the Friedel Crafts acylation reaction or acylation reaction. So here we have an acid chloride and our aluminum chloride acid catalyst. So the mechanism is very similar, but we're not going to go into detail, like too much detail into it. But what I want you to know is that the catalyst takes away the chlorine, and then the benzene ring is going to connect to this carbon. So this is going to be the product of this reaction. So this turns into a ketone. Next, you can use the Clemison reduction, which is an alloy of zinc and mercury with hydrochloric acid. And it's going to reduce the ketone to an alkane. So notice, this is how you can make propyl benzene. You don't want to use um, propyl chloride with aluminum chloride. You won't get propyl benzene. Instead, um, you're going to get this, you get isopropyl benzene. But if you want to make propyl benzene, use the Friedel Crafts acylation reaction instead of the alkylation reaction because this one won't rearrange. Now you can also add a tert butyl chloride. Now because the chlorine is on the tertiary carbon um, it's not going to rearrange. So you can get 
terbutylbenzene. But now let's talk about oxidation of benzene rings. Let's go back to uh, KMnO4 of H2O+. Let's say we have a terbutyl group, a methyl group, an ethyl group, and this long chain um, isopropyl group. If you add potassium permanganate with H3O+, all of the substituents, all of the carbon atoms will be oxidized, except this one. This carbon has no benzylic hydrogens, it's quaternary. This carbon has the benzylic hydrogen, this one too, and this one too. All of the other structures will be oxidized. So this is going to be the product of this reaction. Now we talked about this reaction before. We use methyl chloride, then once we add potassium permanganate, it turns into a carboxylic acid. So every carbon structure outside of the benzene ring, except for the terbutyl group, will turn into a carboxylic acid, regardless of how many carbon atoms it has attached to on a chain. This entire carbon structure will be cleaved. Same thing here too. It doesn't matter what other carbon atoms is attached to it, it's going to turn into um, benzoic acid or a carboxylic acid functional group. The next reaction we're going to talk about is the gadamin koch reaction. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, let's say if you add carbon monoxide and hydrochloric acid with an aluminum chloride catalyst and copper chloride. Basically, your intermediate is an acid chloride, which looks like this. However, this intermediate is not stable, and you can't really store it, so you have to make it in the process of reacting it with a benzene ring. But it works just like the uh, frito crafts acylation reaction, where um, pretty much we're going to take off the chlorine and add this group to the benzene ring. So this is a good way of making benzaldehyde. Um, but you need, like, the reaction conditions are intense. Like, you need high pressure and high temperature to make this reaction work. But there are other ways of making benzaldehyde, though. But this is one way to do it. So now let's talk about grenade reactions uh, with benzene rings. So first let's add uh, bromine with FeBr3 to make bromobenzene. Now what do you think is going to happen if we add magnesium? If you add magnesium uh, to this structure, magnesium inserts itself between the carbon and the bromine atom. So now we have a grenard. And we can react as this is we can react as grenade with many other reagents. By the way, this is called phenyl magnesium bromide. <clears throat> so let's say if we start with phenyl magnesium bromide and let's say we react it with water. If we react it with water, um, you need to be aware that this carbon has a partial negative charge, so it's nucleophilic. It's going to grab a hydrogen and expel hydroxide. So basically, this is going to convert back to benzene. At this point, the magnesium, which is basically a plus two charge, is an ion, and bromide and the hydroxide, they're just going to form a salt, so MgBrOH. But you don't have to worry about that because that's going to be somewhere in the solution. The product of interest is benzene. So that's how you can convert bromobenzene into benzene. Turn it into a Grenade reagent and then add water. Um, if you add deuterium, which is D2, um, D2O, like basically uh, deuterated water, the mechanism will work the same way. But instead of getting uh, benzene, well, this is going to be similar to benzene. Hydrogen and deuterium are isotopes of each other. But you can get this product. let's continue with phenyl magnesium bromide. We can also react it with carbon dioxide. If we do, we're going to get um, benzoate. And if we add H3O+, we can protonate the carboxylate ion. 
And so now we have benzoic acid. So that's another way you can make benzoic acid. It's by reacting a Grignard with uh, carbon dioxide. Let's say if we react it with ethylene oxide, or this 2-carbon epoxide. This will extend the carbon structure by 2 carbons. And so this oxygen will have a negative charge. And then if we add H2O+, plus, this will turn into a primary alcohol. Now what we can also do is using the Grignard, we can add it to an alkyl halide. So this would be an SN2 reaction. So this is another way to alkylate the benzene ring if you don't want to use Friedel Crafts alkylation or acylation. And as you can see, there's hardly any rearrangements. Now, for this to work, you need to use um, a primary alkyl halide. If you use a secondary or a tertiary alkyl halide, you could get an E2 reaction, and um, basically you'll just get benzene plus an alkene. So make sure you use a methyl or primary alkyl halide for that reaction to work. Now let's say if we add it to like benzaldehyde or another carbonyl compound. The Grignard could attack this carbon and then that can open. So now we have like two benzene rings, which looks like this. And then add an H3O plus, we could turn that into a secondary alcohol. Now let's talk about some other reactions that you need to know. So let's um, use nitration and let's make nitrobenzene. Now from nitrobenzene you can make aniline by using any one of the following reactions. You can use uh, a metal with an active metal with an acid such as iron metal and hydrochloric acid you can use zinc metal with hydrochloric acid, or you can use a tin metal with hydrochloric acid. You can also use hydrogen gas with a platinum or palladium catalyst. What's going to happen is the nitro group will be reduced to um, an amine group or an NH2 group. So right now, this was a strongly deactivating group, the nitro group, and now we have a strongly activating group, the amine group. At this point, if we add sodium nitrite with hydrochloric acid under very cold conditions, um, we can get a diazonium salt. This reaction is called diaz diazotization, I believe. But it looks like this. This nitrogen has a positive formal charge, and it forms an ion pair or salt with a chloride ion. So once we have that diazonium group, we can create a lot of different products. So we can add copper bromide. And that's going to put a BR on it. We can add copper chloride. And that's going to put a CL. You might be thinking, okay, I know how to put a bromine on a ring and a chlorine on a ring. So what's the point of this reaction? Later in this video, I'm going to give you a problem, and you're going to see why this reaction is important. By the way, whenever you react a diazonium salt with, let's say, a copper one salt, like copper bromide, copper chloride, or copper cyanide, that is referred to as the Sandmeyer reaction, or it's known as the Sandmeyer reaction. The N2 group is a very good leaving group because it leaves as nitrogen gas, and nitrogen gas is very stable. Here, we're going to replace the N2 group with a cyanide. Now, there's some more reactions that I want to talk about. Let's see if I can fit it in here. If we add um, HBF4, which is basically H plus and BF4 minus, 
we can replace the N2 group with a fluorine group. And uh, there's two more we need to go over. If we add H3O+, plus, we can completely get rid of the N2 group. So basically, actually no. We can get rid of it, but we're going to replace it with uh, an alcohol. So that's how you can get phenol. The last one is uh, H3PO2. And that's how you can go back to benzene. It's going to replace the N2 group with a hydrogen. So as you can see, there's a lot of reactions that you need to know for this test. Okay, so let's focus on applying some of these reactions. So, let's say if you started with benzene. What's the product of this reaction if you add uh, SO3 with H2SO4? This is sulfonation, and the product is simply SO3H. We can put it anywhere on the benzene ring. Now let's say if we continued and we added uh, methyl chloride with ALCl3. This is the frito crafts alkylation reaction. And the SO3 group will determine where that methyl group is going to go. So now we have to go back to the very beginning of what we talked about. SO3H, is it an activator or a deactivator? And is it an orthopara director or a meta director? SO3H is strongly deactivating and it's a meta director. And meta is basically on the third carbon from the directing group. So this is carbon one, and that's two, this is carbon three. This is also carbon three. So the methyl group can go here or here. But because of symmetry, um, those two positions are identical. So we simply have to put it on one of them. So we're going to put the methyl group here. Now let's say if we continued and um, let's say we add let's say if we choose to add chlorine with ALCl3 where is the chlorine going to go? So let's look at the uh, SO3H group, it's a meta director so it can only direct the chlorine to this position now the CH3 group is an ortho para director ortho is 1, 2, so this is carbon, if that's number 1 this is number 2, so the CH3 group could direct the chlorine atoms to go here or here the para position is 1, 4. So this is number 3, and this is number 4. The methyl can also direct the chlorine group to go here as well. So chlorine is being directed to all four positions. Which position will it go to? Well, for one thing, it doesn't really want to go here because of these two bulky, relatively bulky groups. There's too much uh, steric factors over here. So it's going to approach the benzene ring from the uh, from a site that's more accessible which is the left side the left side is more accessible than the right side so we're not going to consider this position it's too sterically hindered now both the SO3 H group and the methyl group are directing it in different locations however who who is stronger is the methyl group stronger than the uh, sulfonic group or is it the other way around so now we got to go back to that chart the methyl group is an R group which is weakly activating the SO3H group is a strongly deactivating group so methyl activates the ring more than the SO3H group so methyl is going to direct it it's going to tell the chlorine where to go because it's more activating than the SO3H group so chlorine will go either here or here. So we're going to get a mixture of products. So whenever you have to decide like where or which group is going to like determine where the new group is going to go, look at which one is more activated. In this case, methyl is more activated, so it's going to tell where the chlorine should go. Or it's going to direct the chlorine uh, where to go in the ring. So this is, these are the two products that we're going to get for this reaction. So let's try another example like this. So starting with benzene, what is the product of this first step? 
if we had nitric acid and sulfuric acid. By now you know this is nitration and we're simply going to add an NO2 group. But let's put it on the top. We could put it anywhere on the ring. Now, let's say if we add um, a 3 carbon acid chloride. So this is the Friedel Crafts acylation reaction. Where is the NO2 going to direct uh, this group? We know NO2 is a meta director, so it's going to tell the acid chloride to go here. And the Lewis acid catalyst is going to remove the chlorine atom. So then this is going to be our product. We're going to get a ketone. So now let's say if we add uh, bromine with FeBr3, which is the catalyst. So this is bromination. Where is the bromine going to go? On which part of the ring? Now, NO2 is a meta director, so NO2 will want the bromine atoms to go on the on this position, which is on the third carbon with respect to NO2. Now, the ketone is also a meta director. It's moderately deactivated. If this is carbon 1, this is 2, this is 3, the ketone will also tell the bromine atom to go here. And both groups are directing it towards the same position, so that's where bromine is going to is going to go. So this is our only product, or this is the only product of the this reaction. Try this example. So what if we have two benzene rings? And let's say if we add a Br2 with FeBr3. Where is the bromine atom going to go and on which ring? So go ahead and feel free to pause this video and try this uh, yourself. So what we need to find out or what we need to know is which ring is more activated. Is it the ring on the left or the ring on the right? What would you say? The ring on the left is deactivated because this ring sees a carbonyl group. A carbonyl group is a deactivated, a moderately deactivated group. That carbon is partially positive. Both of these oxygens are pulling electron density away from the carbon. And so this benzene ring sees a partial positive carbon, and that partially positive carbon makes the benzene ring um, less nucleophilic. So it's less reactive towards electrophilic aromatic substitution, which is what we're dealing with right now. However, it's more reactive towards nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So this ring is deactivated, so it's not going to do anything. This oxygen has a lone pair, and it's partially negative, so it makes the ring more nucleophilic towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. So this is the ring in which bromine is going to go on. Now keep in mind, I'm just going to draw the resonance structures. This ring is activated because the oxygen can donate electron density to it. As you can see, it can put a negative charge on that carbon. And this ring is deactivated because the carbonyl removes electron density away from that ring. And as you can see, the ring has a positive charge instead of a negative charge. And in EAS, the ring has to be the nucleophile. And right now, this ring is more nucleophilic than this one because it has a partial negative charge. So the bromine atom is going to go on the ring that's on the right, the one that's activated. So whenever it's attached to um, like an oxygen atom directly that has a lone pair, that's the activated ring. Now, where is the bromine atom going to go on that ring? Now, this oxygen is a moderately activating group because it's also attached to this carbonyl group. 
which kind of weakens the oxygen. But it's still an orthopair direction, which means that bromine can go here or here. But this is a relatively big group, so ortho is not as favored as para, even though it still can occur. But we're just going to draw the para position or the para group for now. Because this side is more accessible um, than these sides. However, statistically, we have this. There's twice. We have a probability of. The bromine atom is two times more likely to go in the ortho position than the para position if it wasn't for steric factors. Because there's two ortho positions and one para position. So you also have to take that into consideration. But because this group is bulky, we're just going to put the BR on the para position. Sometimes I'm at a loss for words. You probably haven't noticed that by now. Okay, so now we have this product. And uh, let's say if we add one more electrophile, in this case, ethyl chloride with aluminum chloride. Where is the ethyl group going to go? We know the catalyst is going to take away chlorine. So let's look at the direction effects. This oxygen will direct the ethyl group to go in the ortho position, which are those two, which is the same. But the bromine atom is also orthoparadirectin, and it's going to tell the ethyl group to go here or here. The top is the same as the bottom because of symmetry. So which is going to win? Bromine or oxygen? Well, we need to know which of these two atoms is more activating. It turns out the oxygen. This oxygen is moderately activating, and bromine is weakly deactivating, so uh, the oxygen has priority. So then this is going to be our product. Now, I do want to mention something, because I don't think I've mentioned it before. We said that phenol is strongly activating, and um, an ester, which looks like this, is moderately deactivating. Or at least, we, I showed it to you in the beginning of this video, but I probably didn't talk about it as much. Now. The reason why phenol is strongly activating is because all it can do is simply donate electron density to the ring. Now, this oxygen can do that as well. However, it's weakened by the carbonyl group that's next to it. This carbonyl group is an electron withdrawn group, but the oxygen is an electron donating group, just like the, the um, phenol. However, the electron withdrawn group pulls on these oxygen atoms, so the benzene ring doesn't always receive electrons from that oxygen because of the resonance structure. So therefore that's why um, this group is moderately deactivated instead of strongly activated. However this is the major resonance form between uh, these two so this is the minor one. So this oxygen with a positive formal charge doesn't really deactivate the ring that much. Because this is the major resonance contributor, the ring usually sees an oxygen with a partial negative charge instead of a positive formal charge. So that's why overall this is still considered an electron donating group because the electron donating group is attached directly to the ring. If the ring was attached directly to the carbonyl group, overall it would be electron withdrawn instead of electron donating. So it's really dependent on which group is directly attached to the benzene ring. So now that we've covered direct and effects, ortho, para, meta stuff, um, reactivity, the reactions that you need to know, let's talk about synthesis and how to make products. So let's say if um, you're given this problem on a test and you want to start from benzene, well, starting from benzene, you want to make this product. How would you do it? So feel free to pause the video 
and using the reactions that you now know go ahead and list the reagents that you need to make this product now the real question is should we add the sulfur group first or the methyl group first should we add SO3H or CH3 well SO3H is the meta director and let's say if we perform the reaction in this order this is not the correct order by the way let's say if we use sulfonation followed by Friedel-Crafts alkylation so the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to get the SO3H group and then once we add the methyl chloride the SO3H group is the meta director and it's going to tell it to go here and so we won't get the product that we want so for these type of questions the order matters the order in which you choose your reagents is very important so we what we have to do is make this number one and this number two now let's say if we add the methyl chloride group first so we're gonna get CH3 or just CH3 the chlorine is gonna leave and then we can um, add sulfur trioxide with sulfuric acid. Now the CH3 group is an ortho pair director so it can direct the SO3 group here or here. These two are the same. Now because the methyl group is not very bulky the ortho will be the major product instead of the para. If we had a bulky group here um, para is going to be the major product. But if your substituent is methyl, I remember seeing it in the textbook, it's like 60% ortho, 40% para. If you have like an ethyl group, it's like 50-50. But if you have like a tert butyl group, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's predominantly para because tert butyl groups are very bulky. But 40% para is still significant though. So I would just write both, but since we're only concerned with making this product, we're going to focus on the uh, ortho position. So the way you would write your answer is step one, you would use methyl chloride and aluminum chloride. And step two, um, you need to use sulfur trioxide and H2SO4. So here's another one. Let's say if you're starting from benzene and you wish to make this product. So for each of these synthesis problems, Feel free to pause the video and try it yourself, and then unpause it and see if you have the right answer. Okay, so let's plan a mental, let's make a mental outline of uh, how to uh, make this product. If we add the methyl group first, we won't get the answer we want because methyl is orthopara directed. And right now, these two groups are meta with respect to each other. If this is carbon 1, then this is carbon 3. So we need a meta director. Now NH2 is an ortho para director. So if we put the NH2 first on the ring, it's going to tell the methyl group to go in the ortho para position. So that's not going to work either. So what can we do in this reaction? What we need to know is that there's an intermediate um, before we make the NH2 group. To make NH2, we have to make NO2 first. And NO2 is a meta director. So here's what we're going to do. Step one, we're going to use nitration with sulfuric acid and that's going to add the NO2 group and before we convert that to NH2 we're going to add the methyl group because the NO2 group is going to tell it to go in the meta position and then after that we can reduce NO2 to NH2 using um, let's say tin with hydrochloric acid so step one was nitration so here's the NO2 group Step two, Friedel Crafts alkylation. Actually, let me put the NO2 group here. So it's going to direct the methyl group to go in the meta position, which is here. 
And then step three, reduction. The NO2 will be converted to an NH2 group once we use tin metal and hydrochloric acid. Starting from benzene, how can you make this product? Now be careful with this one. I haven't talked about it yet, but I think now it's a good time to talk about it. Go ahead and try that one. So we apparently don't want to add this group first because <coughs> the ketone is a uh, meta director. And uh, these two groups are para with respect to each other. Para is 1, 4. And we don't want to add NO2 first. Well, we don't want to add NO2 and then the ketone because NO2 is a meta director. We need to use the NH2 group because it's a para director. So it appears as if we need to add HNO3 first with sulfuric acid and then add reduce it. This time we'll use like Fe and HCl and then add the acid chloride with the catalyst. But there's an issue with this reaction that you have to be aware of. By the way, that's not the right answer. That, it seems like it's the right answer, but it, it's not. And I'll explain why. So the first step is nitration. So now we have our NO2 group. And then once we add iron metal with hydrochloric acid, it reduces into an NH2 group. Now here's the issue. The NH2 has a lump here. And if we react it with the acid chloride, it's going to become deactivated. This is a powerful Lewis acid catalyst. And aluminum has a positive 3 charge because chloride has a minus 1 charge. And because nitrogen has a partial negative charge, it's attracted to the aluminum catalyst. So it's going to uh, combine with it. And once that happens, nitrogen will no longer have a partial negative. Well, it's going to have a positive formal charge, I should say. Whenever nitrogen has four bonds, it has a positive formal charge. And whenever it has a positive formal charge, it's no longer an orthopara director, which is what we want. It's now a strongly deactivated meta director. So this benzene ring doesn't want to even react anymore. So pretty much this reaction stops if we do this. So you don't want to add the catalyst in the presence of an amine group. Instead, what you want to do is you want to use the amine group and you want to react it with an acid chloride. However, this is the important part. You want to react it with the acid chloride without the ALCL3 catalyst. So I'm going to write it here, but I'm going to take it out. So don't add this with the acid um, chloride. So react the amine with the acid chloride, but without the acid catalyst. So what's going to happen is these two are going to combine, and we're going to remove HCl. The amine is going to be converted into an amide. If you take away HCl, we're going to have a nitrogen um, that has a hydrogen. One hydrogen is gone. One um, is still there. And notice that it's an amide now. Basically, what we, have, what we just did is we added a protecting group to the amine. We turn it into an amide. And this process is reversible. If we add H3O plus with heat, we can hydrolyze the amide and get back the uh, amine group. But we don't want to do that yet. So now that we have the amide, we can react it with another Lewis acid, another acid chloride. And because of the lone pair on this nitrogen, it's still an orthopair director. It's no longer strongly activated, but it's moderately activated. The carbonyl groups weaken the uh, 
electron donating effects of the NH2 group. But that's a good thing because we can now perform this reaction. Because the, um, the nitrogen group is no longer as active as it was before, um, it won't react with the acid chloride, and here's why. The carbonyl group can pull electron density away from the nitrogen, and so it has a resonance form. So notice the partially, the positive formal charge of the resonance form. Now this positive charge doesn't make the ring deactivated because this resonance form is the major contributor, this one is the minor contributor. So for the most most of its time, the ring sees this lone pair, and so it's still orthopair um, directing, but it's not as nu um, nucleophilic as the NH2 group, so this catalyst doesn't react with this nitrogen. So this nitrogen doesn't pair with the catalyst, which is good. That means that this reaction can work now. So the catalyst can take away chlorine, and the benzene ring is going to react with the acid chloride. So whenever you have an NH2 group and you want to perform some sort of electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, uh, be careful because if you use a powerful catalyst like ALCL3 or FEBR3, it's going to deactivate the NH2 group, and so the reaction won't work. So what you need to do is add this protecting group, then perform the reaction, and then remove the protecting group. So we want the para product, which is going to be over here. All right, so now I'm going to be drawn, but I'm going to rotate it a little. So I'm going to put the nitrogen back on the top instead of the top right position. So now we have this. Our last step is to add H3O+. And that's going to basically hydrolyze this bond. It's not going to affect a ketone. So now we have our amine group. And now we have our ketone. So whenever you have an amine, and if you have like powerful acidic conditions, right now it should be H3, NH3+, by the way, because we have a strong acid. But if any time you add like a Lewis acid to it, or even H3O+, the NH2 will turn into like a NH3 group or a nitrogen with a plus charge if you add an ALCL3, and it's going to deactivate the ring, and it's going to be a meta director instead of an orthopara director. So watch out for that. So right now, by the way, we need heat to make this work. If we add another group to this, this right now is a meta director, but here it was an orthopara director, so that's why this group still went over here. Um, but we need to convert that back to NH2. So what we need to do is um, add a dilute solution of water and sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide will deprotonate the extra hydrogen. So now we have NH2 and we have our ketone. So that's it for that example. I know it was a long discussion, but um, it was a necessary one. So real quick, how do you make benzoic acid from benzene? Do you remember this one? Because chances are this will be on your test. Now, we covered this one already. The first step was to add methyl chloride with the ALCL3 catalyst and then oxidize it with potassium permanganate and H3O+. Now, do you remember how to make styrene from benzene? We've also covered this earlier. Step one was to add ethyl chloride. So we get the two carbons that we need. Step two was to add NBS, to add a bromine on the uh, benzylic carbon, which is right here. And then step three was to use an E2 reaction. We can use sodium hydroxide or some other strong base, like sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide, or even terbutoxide. And then we can get styrene. But instead of styrene, 
instead of a double bond on the outside, how can you make a triple bond instead? How would you do that? Well, those same three reactions that we covered, we want to um, use those three reactions to make styrene. Now, once you have styrene, what you want to do is um, add bromine. And you can use dichloromethane, which is the nonpolar solvent. Well, slightly polar, but relatively nonpolar. So what this is going to do is going to add two bromine atoms across the double bond. And there's a hydrogen here, and there's a hydrogen there. So now what you want to use is um, sodium hydroxide, and it's going to convert to the alkyne. So here's what's going to happen first. Hydroxide is going to grab one of the hydrogen atoms, and then this is going to form a double bond, and it's going to expel the bromine atom. So right now what we have is I need to start on another page. We have a double bond. Um, we still have a bromine atom on this carbon, and we still have a hydrogen here. So another hydroxide molecule could grab this hydrogen, form a triple bond, and expel the bromine atom. So now we have an alkyne. But now let's say if you want to start from benzene, and you want to extend a carbon chain using an alkyne. How would you do it? Now keep in mind, there's a hydrogen here. And so what we want to use is um, sodium amide, NaNH2. The amide ion is a very powerful base. And it can remove this hydrogen and put a negative charge on that carbon. So now you have an alkyne with a negative charge. And notice that we need to add um, one, two, three, four carbons. So what you need is a four carbon alkyl halide and then perform your SN2 reaction. So this carbon is going to attack that carbon and it's going to expel the bromine atom and then you're going to get this product. So now let's say if you have um, benzene and you want to make uh, benzyl alcohol. How would you do it? Now there's many ways of doing this. The first is we can use the gadamin uh, koch reaction, which is carbon monoxide, HCl, AlCl3, and CuCl. We talked about this earlier in this video. It creates an acid chloride, but a one carbon acid chloride, which is very unstable. And so the Lewis acid catalyst removes the acid chloride, or removes the chlorine from the acid chloride. And uh, we're going to get a one carbon aldehyde group. Now, you can use a reducing agent like NaBH4 or lithium aluminum hydride. And it's going to reduce the aldehyde to a primary alcohol. That's one way you can do it. Another way is you can add bromine with FeBr3. That's going to create bromobenzene and then followed by magnesium. So you can create a Grignard reagent. Once you have your Grignard reagent, you can use carbon dioxide which will turn it into a and benzoate group. And then you can reduce it using lithium aluminum hydride, which can reduce carboxylic acids into alcohols, and then followed by protonation. Or you can call it aqueous workup. So starting from benzene, try this example. How would you make uh, this product? How can you make a four carbon alcohol with the alcohol being on the first carbon, on the benzylic carbon? So what we need is a Grignard reagent. So we're going to add, um, we're going to perform bromination and then we're going to add magnesium in the second step. So initially we are going to get this uh, MGBR group. So once we have phenyl magnesium bromide, we can react it with an aldehyde. So basically we need a four carbon aldehyde. So one, two, three, four. 
So what's going to happen is this grain is going to attack the carbon, and that pi bond is going to break. So initially we have an alkoxide ion, and then followed by H2O plus, or even water. Water can work. This is going to grab a hydrogen, expel hydroxide. And so now, we have this product. How can you convert benzene into phenol? How would you do it? Now this is another reaction that we've covered already. But feel free to pause the video and see if you can figure it out. So the first step is nitration. HNO3 with H2SO4. That's the first step. So that's going to add an NO2 group to the benzene ring. Step two is to reduce it using um, zinc metal with uh, hydrochloric acid. So now we have an NH2 group. Step three is to use sodium nitrite with HCl. Sometimes you may see this as HONO, HONO2, or HNO2. This combination makes uh, nitrous acid, and nitrous acid converts the amine into a diazonium salt, which looks like this. And this nitrogen has a plus charge. Now from here, we can make a lot of different products. But if you want to make phenol, simply add H2O+. This is a very good leaving group. It leaves as nitrogen gas. Now, how do you make anisole from benzene? This is anisole. It has an OCH3 group. How would you do it? So first, we're going to use the same four steps that we just covered. And uh, we're going to make phenol first. So after nitration, followed by reduction, followed by diazotization, followed by H3O+, we're going to make phenol. And then once you have phenol, you can simply, there's a lot of things you can do. You can react it with an alcohol using an acid catalyst. And so you can remove H2O, and it's going to turn into an ether. That's one way you can do it. Or you can use the Williamson's the Williamson's ether synthesis reaction, which I think we should go over. So in this reaction, the first step is deprotonation. So phenol is a relatively acidic alcohol. Most alcohols have a pK of like 16 or 18, but because of resonance, phenol has a pK of 10. So hydroxide is a suitable base um, that we can use to remove the uh, acidic hydrogen. So now we have phenoxide. By the way, um, this ring is even more activated than phenol because of the negative charge on the oxygen. So once you have phenoxide, we can now react it with an alkyl halide, like methyl chloride. So this oxygen is going to attack the methyl, expel the chlorine group, and that's how we can make an ether. Simply deprotonate the hydrogen and then add an alkyl halide to it. Now we can make different types of ethers. All we got to do is just change the number of carbons in that structure. So that's how you can make anisole. Now, something you should be aware of when you're dealing with phenol. When you deprotonate it, when you remove that hydrogen, if carbon dioxide is present, if this reaction is exposed to the air, it can react with carbon dioxide. This ring is strongly activated because of the negative charge of the phenoxide ion. So this lone pair can form a double bond and cause this double bond to attack carbon dioxide. This is the Kolbe-Schmidt reaction, by the way. And now there's a hydrogen here. 
So if we have fermion oxide, chances are we have a small amount of hydroxide in the solution because this reaction is occurring under basic conditions. Hydroxide could also react with carbon dioxide to create carbonate, by the way. Now hydroxide could remove the hydrogen. These electrons could form a double bond. And um, we're going to get the phenoxide ion again. So now the benzoate group deactivates the ring. Well, it's not really completely deactivated yet, but it weakens it because it's a... Uh, it's a deactivating group. But the phenoxide is still activating, so overall this benzene ring should still be activating, but it wasn't as active as it was before because this carbonyl group is a deactivator. So we can say it's less activating, but still activating overall. So this could react with another CO2 molecule. But if we had H3O+, plus, then we can get this product. And if I remember correctly, I believe this is called salicyclic acid. And um, it's one step closer to making acetyl salicyclic acid, which is aspirin. So now let's say if you have the benzene ring, and um, if you want to make a... Uh, let's say if you want an ester. So we covered how to make phenol, how to make an ether, but what if you want to make an ester? How would you do it? I ran out of space. So first you want to make phenol using the same four steps, nitration, reduction using zinc and HCl, um, diazotization, and then H3O+. Once you have phenol, then you can react it with a carboxylic acid. using an acid catalyst. So all you gotta do is remove water and then connect the two groups together. And that's how you can make an ester. So in the case of aspirin, once we have um, this compound, once we have phenol with benzoic acid, all we gotta do is add another carboxylic acid. And this oxygen is more nucleophilic than this hydroxyl group, so this is going to react with the carboxylic acid. And so now we have acetyl salicyclic acid, which is aspirin. And water was removed. Now, Here's another uh, synthesis problem for you. Let's say if you have benzene and you want to create 1,3,5 tribromobenzene. How would you do it? Now you might be wondering, okay, I could simply add bromine with FeBr3 three times. If you add it the first time, Nothing's wrong with that. You're going to get a bromine atom here. But notice that this bromine atom is not meta direct in this ortho para direction. It's going to direct the second bromine atom to go here or here or here, which is what we don't want. All of these bromine atoms are meta with respect to each other. So, how can we make this work? If we add more bromine atoms, we won't get that product. So, here's what you need to do. The key is not to add bromine at the beginning. Starting with benzene, you want to add uh, nitration. You want to add a nitro group, so you want to perform nitration. But you want to do it three times, not just once, but three times. So, initially, the first nitro group is going to add very quickly to the ring, because the benzene ring is not activated or deactivated. And a nitro group is a very powerful electrophile. Now, adding the second nitro group is going to be, it's going to take longer because once the first nitro group is on the benzene ring, the ring is deactivated. So you may have to like heat up the reaction mixture and increase the reaction time, but it can work though. By the way, NO2 is a meta director, so it directed here. Now that we have two NO2 groups, they're going to both direct the 
the third NO2 group to go to that position. But now the ring is even more deactivated. So you probably have to add more heat, more reaction time to make it work, but you can still get the job done. You just got to add more energy to it. So now this ring is fully nitrated. So now what we want to do is reduce it using Fe and HCl. So we're going to convert all of the NO2 groups into an NH2 group. Now you might be wondering, okay, where am I going with this? And you'll see in a minute. Just hang in there. So now we're going to use sodium nitrite with hydrochloric acid, which can also be written as HONO or simply HNO2. It's going to convert the NH2 groups into um, the diazonium groups. Now keep in mind, there's a chloride ion for each N2 group. So our next step is to add copper bromide, excess copper bromide. This is the Sandmeyer reaction. And it's going to replace the N2 group with bromine atoms. And that's how you can make 1,3,5-tribromobenzene. Now here's a question for you. Let's say if you have a nitro group. How can you convert it back to benzene? How would you do it? To convert it back to benzene, we need to replace it with a hydrogen. And we can do that by converting it to an NH2 group. We can use iron metal with HCl. And then once we have the NH2 group, we can use HONO or sodium nitrite with HCl. So now we have our diazonium salt. And then the last step we need to do is uh, add H3PO2. This reaction is going to replace this group with a hydrogen. So that's how you can convert nitrobenzene back to benzene. But now let's say if you have benzene. What can you do to make um, fluorobenzene? How would you do it? So first, we need to use the same three steps, nitration, reduction, and then diazotization to make the N2 group. Once we have the N2 group, then we can simply add HBF4, which is basically H plus and boron with three fluorine atoms. The boron has a negative formal charge. And it's going to replace this group with a fluorine atom. Here's another question for you. Let's say if you have benzene. How can you make <coughs> excuse me? How can you make uh, two benzene rings attached to each other? So how can you make basically dibenzene? Think about this one and see if you can figure it out. Feel free to pause the video, do some research. Now I want to show you something. Here's a hint that's going to help you out. Let's say if you have phenol attached to or next to para-chloronitrobenzene. Actually, let me redraw it. I want to draw the nitro group like this. What do you think is going to happen in this reaction? Well, what you need to realize is that if we want to com if you want to combine two benzene rings together, you need an activated ring and a deactivated ring. This ring is activated because of the electron donating group. And this ring is deactivated because of the electron withdrawn group. So basically, this ring is the nucleophile because it's electron rich, and this ring is an electrophile. In organic chemistry, the nucleophile always reacts with the electrophile. And let's talk about why. This oxygen has some lone pairs, and it can donate electron density uh, to the ring. 
this double bond can move here, and this double bond can put a negative charge on the para position. Now, the nitro group is an electron withdrawn group, and it can pull electron density away from the ring. So notice the two structures that we now have. So we have an oxygen that has a double bond, and it's attached to the ring. And we now have a negative charge on a paracarbon. And this oxygen has a positive formal charge. And if we drew the resonance structure, or if we draw the resonance structure for um, this group, this oxygen now has a negative charge. And that one already had a negative charge to begin with. Now there's a chlorine atom here, and this carbon has a positive charge. But chlorine does have some lone pairs, so it can stabilize that positive charge if it wants to donate a pair of electrons. We're not going to do that though. But the fact is that this carbon has a partial positive charge, and this carbon is partially negative. These are the minor uh, resonance contributor forms of the reactions that we started with. But the fact is that this ring is nucleophilic, and it's going to attack the ring that's electrophilic. So those two benzene rings can combine. Now, the chlorine group is crucial to making this reaction work, because we need a leaving group. You'll see why soon. In the beginning of this video, we talked about electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions and nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Um, for electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, the electrophile um, replaces the hydrogen atom. And in the beginning, we talked about for NAS, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions, the nucleophile replaces a leaving group, in this case, the chlorine. So this is the nucleophile. And right now, for this benzene ring, it's undergoing an EAS reaction. The hydrogen atom that's right here will be replaced with the electrophile, which is this entire benzene ring, this whole structure. And for this benzene ring on the right side, it's undergoing an NAS reaction because it's reacting with a nucleophile, which is this. And in such a reaction, the nucleophile kicks out the leaving group, which is the chlorine group. So notice what's going to happen. So we have a double bond here, a double bond here. We still have a hydrogen. We still have the chlorine, which is going to leave soon. And here we have a double bond. So this oxygen with a negative charge is going to reform a double bond. This double bond is going to go back here where it was. And this double bond is going to move here, and it's going to expel the chlorine leaving group. And since I'm out of space, I need to go back to the drawn board and make a new page. So now this ring is aromatic again. And so we have our normal nitro group. The chlorine has been expelled, but now we have to remove a hydrogen. And this oxygen still has a positive formal charge. So we need to use the base. The base could be the solvent. If this reaction occurs under water, like, or with water as a solvent. We can use water as a solvent or something else. I haven't really specified the reaction conditions, but for the sake of keeping things simple, let's just use water as the solvent. So water's going to grab a hydrogen, and this bond has two electrons, which those electrons will be used to form a double bond. That double bond is forced to move over here, and this bond breaks, and oxygen pulls those electrons toward itself. So that oxygen pulls all of those electrons toward itself. Excuse me. So now we have our second aromatic ring. So that's how you can convert, you can put two benzene rings together. But in the example that we talked about, this is just a hint, by the way, all of this discussion. This whole discussion was a hint. 
The issue with this one, though, is we can't get rid of the hydroxyl group. I mean, we don't have a reaction where we can replace that with a hydrogen. Maybe there is one. I don't know what it is. But I do know that we can replace the NO2 group with a hydrogen. We need to remove all groups and replace them with hydrogen if we want to make dibenzene. The nitro group, we can convert it to NH2 group, and we can convert that into a N2 group, then add H3PO2 and get the benzene ring. So first, let's start with benzene, and let's make the reagents that we need. So first, we can add chlorine, Cl2, with FeCl3. That's going to put the Cl on the first carbon. And then followed by nitration. Now we're going to get this group. OK, so that was the electrophile uh, that we had when we want to connect the two benzene rings together. To make the nucleophile, here's what we need to do. We're going to um, add nitric acid again. Now, following nitration, we're going to reduce it to an amine group. So we're going to use zinc and HCl. Now, the NH2 group can act just like the phenol group because it's a powerful electron donating group, just like phenol. So once we isolate the NH2 group and make sure it doesn't have any positive charge, this is going to be our nucleophile. And now we have the electrophile. And using the same mechanism that we did last time, we're going to get this product. the chlorine is going to leave. So basically, this is a coupling reaction. Now, what we could do next is reduce this, reduce the NO2 group to an NH2 group using FeHCl. So now we have two NH2 groups. Next, we can react this with um, sodium nitrite and HCl to make a diazonium salt. Now there may be some side reactions in this process because chances are doesn't the N2 groups don't form at the same time. Because let's say if one side has an NH2 and the other side has an N2 group, the ring with the NH2 could react with the other ring that has the N2 group. And I'll give an example of that. But those would be side products. Let's focus on the product that we want to get. So this reaction won't occur with 100% yield. So just keep that in mind that side products will occur. But at this point, what we can do is add H3PO2. And then that's going to replace the N2 group with a hydrogen. So now we have made dibenzene. There's probably other ways of making dibenzene, but this is just one of many ways of doing it. And it's probably not the most efficient way, but this is just a, a learning exercise. But that's how you can make it, though. Now here's a question for you. Let's say if you have phenol, or let's say even um, aniline, NH2 with a benzene ring, and you add it to this. So this is an, another example of a coupling reaction. And this is why I was saying that you can have some side products. Because if this was H2N, which we had in the last example, it can react with um, this group as well. So what's going to happen if we put these two, to, uh, these two groups together? So this oxygen is going to form a double bond. That double bond is going to move here. And then this double bond is going to attack the nitrogen group. And then a triple bond is going to go down to a double.
So now we have two lone pairs. And um, we have a double bond here, another double bond. This oxygen now has a positive charge and one lone pair. And there's still a hydrogen here. So now we got to remove the hydrogen. So whatever the base is in this reaction, maybe it's a chloride ion, it's going to grab the hydrogen. These electrons will form a double bond. That double bond is going to move here. And then we're going to get an alcohol again. So that's another way you can couple uh, two benzene rings together. Just keep in mind, when you do so, the triple bond is now reduced to a double bond. NH2 could have done the same thing. And in that last example that we covered, when we had the dibenzene ring, chances are that the N2 groups won't be converted to um, the NH2 groups won't be converted to N2 groups at the same time. So it's possible that this nitrogen could attack this nitrogen, and this could go here. So now notice the structure that we now have. So this could form a polymer. It can keep growing, so to speak. Wait, hold on. This had to be connected to uh, this group. There we go. So this is one of the side products that can occur when I talked about making that dibenzo group. And this polymer could keep growing. This could react with another molecule at this end, and it just could form a long chain polymer. So in chemistry, you can always get side products, depending on what, what you're reacting with. OK, but let's continue. So now, we've covered all the synthesis reactions that Actually, wait, there's one more I want to talk about. Let's say if you have benzene, how would you make this compound? So how would you connect two benzene rings together by means of an ester? So feel free to pause the video, brainstorm, and try to figure out this one. What you need to do is first, Make a carboxylic acid. Add methyl chloride with aluminum chloride. So now you have your methyl group. You can use ethyl chloride or propyl chloride, doesn't matter. And then use potassium permanganate with H2O. And this will convert it to a benzoic acid. Now the next thing you need to do is make phenol. So you need to use nitration followed by um, reduction, FeHCl. First, you will get the NO2 group, then the NH2 group, and then step three, sodium nitrite with HCl to make the N2 group, and then step four, H3O+. And you want to make phenol. Whenever you add an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, you can get an ester. So now what you want to do is combine the carboxylic acid and the alcohol together. And using an acid catalyst, this reaction is reversible by the way, remove water. So water is going to be a side product. If you add heat to it, 
you can drive the reaction forward because water is going to escape from the reaction mixture. And then that's how you can make this particular compound. So now let's go over mechanism problems. So let's say you have a test and uh, you get this, um, let's say you're given this reactant. How can you propose a mechanism for the formation of this compound? How would you do it? So hopefully you um, have reviewed the mechanism for the Friedel-Crafts alkylation reaction. But the first thing that happens is the chloride reacts with the catalyst. This chlorine is partially, it has a partial negative charge. And aluminum has a plus 3 charge in this structure. So these two are attracted to each other, so chlorine binds with the aluminum. So that's the first step. So now aluminum has a negative formal charge, and chlorine has a positive formal charge. Now this bond can break. Chlorine can take these electrons with it. And so what we now have is an acetylenium carbocation or cation and we have the AlCl4 ion somewhere in a solution. Now this carbocation is resonant stabilized. This lone pair, this oxygen can use one of its lone pairs to form a triple bond and so then you get this uh, carbon with a triple bonded oxygen in which case the oxygen now has the positive formal charge. So you have those two resonance forms, but we're going to use this resonance form to draw the product. Now notice that this molecule can bend, and it can bend in such a way that it can form another ring. So we have four carbons here, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. And on carbon 4, we have a double bond O, and there's a plus charge here. So this benzene ring can use a double bond to attack that carbocation. Whenever a double bond attacks a carbocation, it creates another uh, carbocation. But now the ring is closed. But the question is, where is the other carbocation? It's usually one of these two carbon atoms of the double bond that broke. Now this carbon atom it regained a bond. But this one, it lost the bond and it didn't get it back. So the plus charge is here. Which means that there's a hydrogen here. So now, by the way, keep in mind that AlCl4- minus is in equilibrium with AlCl3 and Cl-. minus. However, um, this form is more stable. We can use chloride or we can use AlCl4- minus as a weak base to grab a hydrogen. But I'm not going to get into the particulars about which base to use, or I'm just going to keep it simple. So chloride is going to grab a hydrogen, and this carbon-hydrogen bond is going to break, regenerating the aromatic ring. And so we get this product. So that's the mechanism for that reaction. Here's another example. So let's say you have an acid chloride and a Grignard reagent. Immediately these two will react. Let me draw this, but that's a chlorine. Propose a mechanism for the formation of this product. So what we need to realize is that this carbon atom is partially negative because magnesium has a positive 2 charge. And this carbon atom is partially positive. 
So the partially negative carbon atom is attracted to the partially positive carbon atom, and so it attacks it. And then when that happens, the pi bond breaks, but the ring closes. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon ring. Now, when this carbanion attacks the carbonyl group, the magnesium bromide um, leaves and it's in a solution somewhere, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. But right now, we have an oxygen with a negative charge, and we still have a chlorine attached to this atom. So then this oxygen uh, reforms the double bond. That tetrahedral intermediate collapses, and it, it expels the chlorine group. And so now we have our product. which looks like that. Try this example. Propose a mechanism for the formation of this product. So the first thing that's going to happen is the chlorine atom is going to react with the catalyst. Let's start with that one. So this aluminum has a negative formal charge and chlorine has a positive formal charge. Now this chlorine could leave, forming a carbocation. Now keep in mind, there's another chlorine atom here. And uh, it could combine with the carbocation. One, two, three, four. We can get a five-membered ring. So I'm just simply drawing the resonance form. And that process is reversible. So we could get this uh, intermediate in, in that example. But we're going to focus on uh, this resonance form, because our goal is simply to propose a mechanism. So now the benzene ring is going to react with this carbocation. And we still have the other chlorine atom here. So we're going to call this carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. So carbon, so here's carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. Carbon 1 has a methyl group, and carbon 4 has a methyl group, and it has a chlorine atom. Now, keep in mind that since we, one of these carbon atoms will form the plus charge, but since this carbon atom was used to create the connection, the plus charge is now on that chlorine atom. Now that chlorine atom can close and form a ring. But we're not really concerned about that particular resonance form. So we have like this seven member ring. But this process is reversible. It can open and close. But right now it's not going to stay that way because we need to regenerate our aromatic ring. So let's go back to this resonance form. Now keep in mind, the other chloride ion, which is combined with AlCl4, Some of it is dissolved in the solution, but most of it is attached to the uh, aluminum chloride catalyst. And the part that's still dissolved, we can use that in, um, as a weak base to grab this hydrogen and 
this bond is going to break, putting a double bond there. So once we regenerate our aromatic ring, this chlorine atom will no longer be attracted to that carbocation, which means it's going to be free to react with the uh, Lewis acid catalyst. Because right now it's not free to react because it can form that seven membered ring. But that's a reversible process. So once we have this, now that chloride ion is free to react with the catalyst. So now chlorine has a positive formal charge. And then it could leave. But it can also come back. So most of these uh, reactions are reversible. But once we have this carbocation, then the benzene ring will attack it, and then it's going to close. So now we have this structure. But we need to find out where the plus, the, uh, plus charge is. Now, because we, um, we form this bond, that means that the plus charge is on this carbon. And that means that we still have a hydrogen atom here. So we're going to use a chloride ion from the solution, which comes from the ALCL4 minus ion. And we're going to use that to regenerate our benzene ring. So now we have our product, which looks like that. Try this one. So benzene, in the presence of another alkene, using HF as a catalyst, and it can make this product. This reaction is very similar to a Frito Crafts alkylation reaction, but without the aluminum chloride catalyst. But go ahead and propose a mechanism for this process. But let's get started. The first thing that happens is the alkene reacts with HF. This double bond grabs the hydrogen and expels the fluoride. So now we have a carbocation, and we have a fluoride ion in a solution. The hydrogen goes on the uh, less substituted carbon atom, which is the secondary one, so we can get a tertiary carbocation. Now, the fluoride could react with the carbocation, and that could be a side product of this reaction. But also, the fluoride well, not the fluoride, also the benzene ring could react with the carbocation as well. So, this won't be your only product. Um, it's definitely going to be one of the products, but you could also have this product in this reaction. But now, our goal is simply to propose a mechanism for the formation of that product. So we're going to combine these two. So the benzene ring is going to uh, attack the carbocation. Now keep in mind that there's two hydrogens here. So this is carbon 1, 2, 3. So 1, 2, 3. On carbon 1 we have two methyl groups. And we still have a hydrogen here and another hydrogen here. So this carbon atom lost the bond so it has the positive charge. And we're going to use fluoride as a weak base to grab this hydrogen and these electrons will be used to regenerate the benzene ring. And so now we have our product. So that reaction wasn't too bad. So now for our last mechanism. Well, this time we're going to propose two mechanisms, actually, but with one reaction. So propose a mechanism for the formation of 
this product and the formation of that product. So feel free to pause the video and try that. Try those examples. So what do you think the first step for this reaction is? Let's start with this one. So starting with styrene, which you know how to make now, we talked about it earlier, we're going to react it with the acid catalyst. So this double bond is going to react with the hydrogen. And in the process, it's going to create a plus charge. The hydrogen is going to go on the less substituted carbon. So the plus charge is on the secondary benzylic carbon. And it's stabilized by the benzene ring because we can draw a lot of resonance structures. But now, once we have that carbocation, it can react with another styrene molecule. But here's a question for you. Which double bond is more reactive? The double bond on the outside or in the benzene ring? Now the double bonds in the benzene rings are very stable because of the aromatic ring. And so they're not very reactive unless there's a, a powerful electrophile in front of it. They could react with the plus charge, but this double bond is far more reactive and is more likely to react with the double bond, with the plus charge. So we're going to say this is carbon 1, which connects to carbon 2, and that's carbon 3. So 1, 2, 3. Carbon 1 has this methyl group, which I'm going to draw on, on top. And so right now we have this structure. The question is, where is the plus charge? Carbon 1 gained the bond, and carbon 2 lost the bond but got it back. Carbon 3 lost the bond, and it didn't get it back, so the plus charge is here. And now there's a hydrogen here. Now we really didn't specify what type of uh, solvent, but let's say we chose H3O+. Plus, or Actually, this styrene is uh, nonpolar, so we need to use a different solvent. All right, so we're going to describe this solvent as like a base, whatever it is. And this base is going to grab a hydrogen, and that carbon-hydrogen bond is going to break and form a double bond. It's always easy to use. It's always easy to use water as a solvent, but since styrene is nonpolar and can't dissolve in water, or doesn't dissolve very well. Um, we can't use water as an example. But that's how you can show the mechanism for the formation of uh, that product. So make sure you know what your solvent is if you're on a test. If not, if, they, if your teacher simply gives you an acid catalyst, use some generic base to remove the hydrogen. But now let's talk about the formation of the other product. Now we're going to start back with this particular carbocation that we had, because the first two steps are the same. But what we're going to do is redraw the structure in a way that it's easy to see what's going to happen. So this is number one, two, three. So here's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Carbon one has a methyl group. Carbon three has a benzene ring. But carbon-3 has a plus charge, and a benzene ring could react with that plus charge, and that's what's going to happen here. And that's how it closes to form the five-membered ring. So mechanisms is something that you just have to practice with, and as you practice, you get better um, at predicting what the mechanism is going to be based on what product you have. So now, we need to find out where the plus charge is. It's usually one of these two carbon atoms. Now this carbon, re it formed a bond, even though it lost a double bond. This one lost a bond, but didn't get it back. So um, the plus charge is now on that carbon. But we still have a hydrogen here. Our last step is to use the base to grab the hydrogen and break the carbon-hydrogen bond. Use those electrons to regenerate the benzene ring. And so now we have our product. 
Now you might be wondering, this is a long video, and this chapter has a lot of information. We've covered most of it. The only thing we didn't cover is, there's a few details we need to talk about on nucleophilic aromatic substitution. We made a comparison between EAS and NAS, but let's review that again. So for electrophilic aromatic substitution, a hydrogen was replaced with an electrophile. So that's why it's called electrophilic substitution. But what we're now going to discuss is nucleophilic aromatic substitution, in which a leaving group, let's say like a bromine atom, is replaced by some sort of nucleophile. The nucleophiles that we're going to use it would be like hydroxide or amide, NH2-. Now keep in mind, um, alcohols, which has lone pairs, NH2, which has a lone pair, those are the activators for the EAS reaction. The activators for the nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions are, these are electron donating groups by the way, but the activators are now the electron withdrawn groups, which are like the NO2 groups, um, SO3H, those groups, they activate the ring towards nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So here's an example. Let's say we have a bromine atom and we have an electron withdrawn group. There's two types of reactions within the nucleophilic aromatic substitution category. And there's one reaction which is called the addition elimination mechanism which proceeds via the, the Meisenheimer complex and then there's the other reaction which proceeds via the benzyne intermediate. What you need to know is if you're performing a nucleophilic aromatic substitution reaction where you add in like a, a hydroxide nucleophile, if you see an electron withdrawn group like an NO2 group, you need to know that this reaction will proceed via the addition elimination mechanism. So we're going to add a group first, and then we're going to eliminate something. We're going to remove something. So we're going to add hydroxide, and then eliminate bromide. The end result is that bromine will be replaced with a nucleophile hydroxide. This is a good way to make phenol, by the way, but you have to get rid of the NO2 group when you're done. So now let's talk about the mechanism. This time, I'm going to draw the NO2 group like this. So the first thing that hydroxide will do is it's going to attack this carbon. Because that carbon is attached to a bromine atom, bromine is electronegative, and it withdraws electron density from that carbon by, me, by means of the inductive effect. So that carbon is partially positive. And hydroxide, having a negative charge, is attracted to that carbon. So it begins by attacking that carbon. And this bond breaks. It can put a negative charge on that carbon. So now we're going to get this structure, which looks like this. And so now we have a negative charge. Now, we can draw another resonance form. This negative charge can move here and put a negative charge in that carbon. So the negative charge can jump um, by two carbons. So now we have a double bond here and one here. And now that negative charge could form... This carbanion can form a double bond, and that double bond is going to break. So now we have another resonance structure, which looks like this. Now, there's a fourth resonance structure, but I'm out of space, so I'm probably not going to draw it. But the lone pair will be right here, 
let me just show you the arrows. This lone pair could form, let me change the color. This lone pair could form a double bond, and this double bond can put another carbanion there. That's the other resonance form. So all of these uh, resonance forms combined is known as the Meisenheimer complex. Now to get the product, one of these oxygens can reform a double bond. This double bond can form another double bond, and that double bond can move here, expelling the bromine atom. So now we have this, an alcohol, um, our benzene ring, which is now aromatic again, and a nitro group. So that's the addition elimination mechanism. We add hydroxide and then we eliminate bromide. The next one is the benzene intermediate. So let's say if we do not have an electron withdrawn group. So if there's no NO2 group in a ring, and let's say if we add a very powerful base, like NH2 minus. Hydroxide, if we use hydroxide, this reaction won't work very well because the ring is not activated towards nucleophilic aromatic substitution. But if we were to use hydroxide to make it work, we would have to use some very high temperature, like over 300 degrees Celsius to make it work. But sodium amide is a very powerful base, and this reaction can work under um, normal room temperature conditions. Now, there's a hydrogen here. And so what sodium amide does is... Uh, the amide ion grabs the hydrogen. These electrons are used to form a triple bond, and then the bromide ion is expelled. So now um, we have a benzene intermediate. As you can see, it's like a benzene ring, but with an alkyne, so they call it uh, benzene. Now the NH2 minus, some of it has been converted to NH3 but you still have some NH2- left over in the uh, solution. It can attack the benzene from this position or from this position. So we can get two, we can get up to two products dependent on, um, or even three products depending on what substituents are already present in the ring. But let's say if it attacks there, the triple bond will be converted to a double bond and it's going to put a carbanion on a ring. So here we have our NH2 group, we have a double bond again, and we have a negative charge. Now notice how we regenerated NH3, or we created NH3. So this carbanion can grab a hydrogen from NH3, regenerating the NH2 minus ion. So the net result was that we replaced the bromide ion with NH2 by means of the benzene intermediate. So because there's no other substituents, we can only get one product. So even if we put the NH2 on this position, these two products are the same. But now let's say if there was a substituent present. Now we can't use an electron withdrawn group. We have to use an electron donating group. Basically, like a weak electron donating group so that we can still have the benzene intermediate. If we use a powerful electron withdrawing group, then it's going to go, the reaction will proceed by means of the addition elimination mechanism. Okay, so if we add amide, we can form the benzene on the right side, or we could form it on the left side. So that means that the NH2 group can go on three different positions. It can go directly where the bromine atom was, or it can go on the right side, or it can go on the left side. I meant to put that on the right side. So, notice that if we have one substituent, we only get two products. 
these products are the same. They're identical. So they're considered as one product. And this one is different. So we get a total of two products in this reaction. Now let's say if we have two different substituents. Let's say we have a methyl and we have an ethyl. And we have a bromine atom here. Now if we use NH2 minus or sodium amide, now we can get all three different products because there's no symmetry anymore. So this is one product. Here's the other product. And then here's the last product. So as you can see, all of these products are different. Um, if we name it, we'll get different names.